Alrighty, kids. Welcome back. Yep. No DJ, D Lober, D Lo Beezy, whichever. Uh, don't have time to waste. All right. So, anyway, I want to talk about Renaissance art today uh, and some of the innovations of Michelangelo. Um, we'll discuss Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. That's it. There's plenty to do, lots of artwork. Um, so, the terminology. Uh, High Renaissance you need to be familiar with uh, refers to the period 1450 to 1527 which brings an end 1527 brings an end um, to the Renaissance at least in Italy um, and that coincides with the sack of Rome which was ordered by uh, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V um, and he was angry at the Pope we'll actually get into that in the next you know when we start talking about Martin Luther and Henry VIII and the Protestant Reformation. But at any rate, um, it is a, the term High Renaissance is used to um, kind of denote the fact that there was tremendous artistic creation taking place mainly in three cities, Florence, Rome, and Venice. Um, the artists that are involved would be uh, Leonardo da Vinci, um, Raphael of Urbino and um, Michelangelo Buona Arte and, and then Titian is the fourth and he is the least familiar I'm sure with all of you because he's not a ninja turtle at any rate um, with regard to some of the uh, differences that exist between the art I think we've already in the last lecture discussed some of that but when we look at medieval art what we have to understand is that most of the time it's non-secular, meaning it's religious in nature. And when that, even with that, there was little attention paid to um, distinguishing features, facial features. Uh, most often, the 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 way in which most medieval paintings were rendered, the faces looked solemn, which means serious. Um, as I said, there was no uh, such thing as a linear perspective. Um, however, during the Renaissance, all of this changes. And um, talking about, if we shift and talk about um, sculptures, the uh, difference, the main difference is that during the um, Renaissance, we start to see freestanding. And of course, we learned that with Donatello's David. But just so that you understand, most of the medieval um, sculptures would be seen uh, usually in or on the outside of a church. Um, and they would be in the form of what's called a, a relief. So they would be only on the surface uh, and they would be sculpted into the stone that was the whatever the made to be part of the wall or the uh, exterior of the church. At any rate... Um, what we're going to see is in many of these paintings, um, there is a revival of the classic notion. This coming from the Greeks, this idea that you need to be um, balanced and that symmetry was important. You'll see that in architecture with the columns, but also there is an importance to be balanced in the painting. Uh, and so paintings oftentimes were symmetrical. All right, and proportional as well, and they use geographic shapes, in fact, to use that um, to 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 get at that. Chiaroscuro was um, a new innovation, painting innovation that was made possible because of oil-based paints being introduced into Italy, uh, and this is an improvement over tempera, which was the earlier form using um, an egg yolk or an egg-based paint. So this is much more uh, realistic, and the chiaroscuro is just simply shadowing, okay? And you can see um, an example of it here. This is um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's, one of his few completed paintings. This is uh, a lady uh, a lady with an ermine, which is a type of uh, uh, weasel. Okay, um, that is what you see there. The chiaroscuro is the shading. So behind the woman, there has um, 
been a darker contrast color used and that was designed to show depth so if you take a moment and look at this portrait you can see that all right so the shadowing helps create depth called chiaroscuro you should be familiar with uh, linear perspective because we've already talked about that okay moving on uh first artist that we're going to discuss is michelangelo uh Buona, Buona Rotti. all right uh, he came from a um, important family um he was I guess commissioned early on um, for in in the in the house of Lorenzo de Medici, who is the grandson of Cosimo de Medici. And remember, this is the very very wealthy banking family that um, whose banks had, um, I guess, not franchises, but um, additional banks located in countries all throughout Europe, and as a result. Because of the, uh, you know, the charges, the finance, the interest charges, they made millions uh, of dollars uh, annually. And so it's obvious then that they could fund the arts. Um, many of his masterpieces were completed in Rome, where he was commissioned by initially a French cardinal to work on uh, something known as the Pieta, which is the uh, crucifixion of Jesus and being held by his um, his mother, the, the Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary. Um, the Cardinal actually wanted this to be completed. This would be part of his, I guess, his burial tomb. It was going to go on the, I guess, top of the uh, crypt, if you will. It, it, and he was supposed to be completed in a year, uh, but it, it took him nine months to find the the type of um, marble rock uh, at, at the quarry that he wanted to use. The, the, the finished, as you'll see in just a moment, is over five feet tall. So this is a very large sculpture indeed. Um, so he had to find just the correct piece. And the cardinal, the French cardinal, died before he finished. Uh, 15, excuse me, 1498 to 1500 was the time that he spent. And so the Pope at the time, Pope Julius II, commissioned him to use that to be placed inside of the um, new, new well, under construction, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So this piece, the Pieta, was done when he was uh, 26 years old. He was a very young man. And um, although it's his first, it's his greatest. Um, as you know, this is my favorite. I've mentioned this. Favorite piece of artwork, uh, pretty much of all time. I uh, want to give you a second to look at it, but it, the detail is unbelievable. Um, it's reported from the, uh, I guess, the contemporary artist Vasari, who wrote uh, a book on on these uh, Renaissance artists, that Michelangelo said that the Pieta, this finished product, was actually inside of the rock just waiting to be car chipped away that it already existed uh, at least in his head it did um and and again this has been chiseled uh, with many different types of chisels but you can see the tremendous uh detail um one of the thing that strikes me is her robe and the way the the various uh, folds of the robe give it an added um element of realism the way the body is draped over her lap, um, it's lifeless. And the ge geometry that I talked about, the, this idea of symmetry and proportionality, one is achieved, but one is not. It is, it is geometrically symmetrical. Uh, Mary uh, seems to be in the shape of a triangle, which is a symmetrical shape, but... As far as proportion goes, it's not. It's not in proportion. Um, and, the, and the reason being is because for Mary, um, for a woman to hold an adult male in her lap, her lap would have to have been much larger than average. And in this particular instance, her lap is very large. So what's interesting, though, is that unless you point that out, you don't pick up on that. And so um, it is 
You know, um, one of the hallmarks of this piece, you know, the genius of it, that despite it not being proportional, you don't even pick up on it. All right, so I want to talk about some other features. Uh, the the distinction between the mother uh, and the son here, you know, in the how he was able to um, demarcate the body away from um, his mother. I mean, it it looks to me that, uh, that he could he could stand up at any moment. Um, one of the things that I'll point out too is we'll we'll talk about uh, I, I, the ideal um, versus realism. So one of the hallmarks of Renaissance art is realism, and you certainly can tell that here. But I almost think that um, the artist's Michelangelo's intention to make this look ideal um, kind of gets in the way a little bit of the rena uh, of the realism. And what I mean is. His body was uh, beaten up. Uh, he was tortured and executed. And aside from, you know, some small wounds, uh, the body does does not look uh, terribly damaged. And I, I think that's very purposeful um, because the artist does not want this to be about death. He wants this to be about abandonment. And the death leads to abandonment you know to the loved ones and that is something that is interesting to note um some other things i want to note if you look at her face um this mother who is obviously very saddened by the loss of her son does not really reveal that is not revealed in this culture um the the, the level of anguish that she no doubt felt is is not really portrayed here, so I don't know how realistic that is. Um, and and the purpose here is that this is the the son of Jesus, or the excuse me, the mother of Jesus. So there there was it was his intention to make her look very dignified. So she is sad, but it is a dignified sadness. Um, the other thing is she's beautiful and she is very youthful. Um, well, Mary is known as the Virgin Mother, that that was the Immaculate Conception, that she did not have sex, um, that, that uh, the angel Gabriel placed the seed in her womb, and Jesus sprung forth from that. So it's interesting. The, the artist is showing the fact that she was not only a virgin, but also sin-free by depicting her as beautiful and young. And I might note that that is neoplatonic okay this idea that beauty is associated with uh, the supreme being okay and the the more virtuous we are um, the younger we will remain okay and so physical beauty was something that the the greeks valued and they associated beauty with goodness and this is uh, i think cleverly put into this sculpture okay hopefully that makes sense and then to the right you notice a little sash that has michelangelo's name and he was a young and i guess proud um, artist and when this was completed the story is that he overheard some visitors to the the construction site of saint uh, peter's basilica saw this um, sculpture kind of in a side room and were curious who did it and no one knew and he was you know the fact that they didn't know it was him made him go in and carve it uh later on he regrets it he, he saw that as a moment of pride uh that and he swore or that he would never you know sign any more of his uh, sculptures we're going to see painters sign their paintings but i don't think we're going to see any more sculptures um that have been signed by the artist uh Let's see. Here in 1972, a crazed um, geologist yelled in, in St. Peter's Basilica that I am Jesus Christ, he says, as he pulls out a hammer, a uh, geologist's hammer, and 14 or 15 swipes at Mary did tremendous damage, knocked her arm off and damaged her face, um, as you can see here. What's surprising is that I guess after he was tackled 
instead of returning the pieces, uh, the, the the bystanders picked up and kept the pieces of marble. So they were forced to kind of go to the behind the uh, sculpture and pick off pieces that could be chiseled and then I guess affixed or glued somehow to her to her face to correct it. So now it's behind bulletproof glass. So no more of that. Um, his second is the um, this is back in Florence. He goes back. They want him to uh, create a statue of David in the um, Florence Square. This thing is 18 feet tall and it took him longer <laughs> to find a piece of granite to carve here. Again, you can see the classical uh, influence here because he is nude. Uh, certainly ideal. Um, very muscular and chiseled. His face shows emotion. This is quite different than the Donatello's David. This is before the battle. He is um, standing and and you can see in the lower box his eyes, his his brow is furrowed and as if he sees uh, the the giant Goliath in the distance. And if you look at his neck muscles, they're strained. So he has a, a concerned look on his face and he is readying himself as he is pulling the sling from his shoulder. What is similar is the contraposto stance that um, Donatello did uh, as if to, you know, suggest that he is getting ready to spring into action. This is no longer, uh, this was outdoors. Uh, it is no longer, it's inside a museum in Florence, but it is still, uh, I guess a duplicate has been erected in the uh, square of Florence, Italy. All right, so this um, was done just after the Pieta. So this is Don, uh, Michelangelo's David, okay? Uh, he was then commissioned, um, or I guess previous, in between the Pieta and the David, he was commissioned to paint the papal um, church or the um, chapel, excuse me, next to St. Peter's Basilica, which hadn't even been completed yet. But he agreed to do it, and um, he painted it, uh, the ceiling, in a fresco. Um, and fresco is wet plaster. And it's very difficult for a painter to complete that because um, as he paints it and it dries, the paint becomes a part of the, pl uh, the plaster. So fresco is, is very difficult because mistakes aren't easily corrected. So they have to draw it out first and then uh, sculpt. So it's very slow and it's very painstaking. Um, and so he was on his back on scaffolding doing this. And you know, I guess the plaster would sometimes, or the paint would drip in his eye. Can't imagine that was too much fun. Um, and fresco is also very, um, I guess it can be damaged by the uh, the elements. But this ceiling, I think, is well insulated because it, it really hasn't damaged uh, after, you know, 400, 500 years. So <clears throat> at any rate, um, let's see, about 10,000 10, square feet, 343 figures. I have an, a number of them I'll show you. Um, the first one, I guess the most iconic, is the uh, creation of man, and it's showing God uh, placing, you know, touching the finger, giving life to Adam. What's interesting is the vessel that he is traveling around in, God, some people suggest that it's a brain, which would kind of um, maybe symbolize the fact that as an artist, he was divinely inspired uh, to create this. Um, below you see the creation of Eve and she is coming out of the rib or the side of Adam. So very interesting depiction. This is just half of, uh, the ceiling, uh, on your left, you can see the creation. And so it starts with, you know, God separating night from dark, creating the planets and then, you know, creating the animals on the earth and then. The, the last panel on the left is creation of Adam. And then, again, on the right here, you see creation of Adam, and it goes through to, it includes the flood, um, being banished from the Garden of Eden, and, uh, I'm not right. yeah, I think the flood is the last scene. Don't ask me about those um, paintings that are flanking it. 
it's too much to talk about. All right, but there you have it. If you want to look at this on your own, you can see all of the different um, uh, paintings that <clears throat> kind of flank the scenes. So it's Old Testament, Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel. Here's some more. There you go. Moving on. All right, so about 30 years later, after Rome had been destroyed, he was invited to come back and complete the Sistine Chapel by doing uh, the wall. And um, by this time, his his style of art, art had had evolved, and, and the Renaissance had kind of officially ended. So we're going to be moving into this era known as... Um, mannerism which i'll talk about in just a second but this is the last judgment of man and so jesus is in the center and he is flanked by saints many of them who have been um their martyrs um <clears throat> and so he is rendering his decision on who should be saved and who should, who is damned and so the angels are in on the bottom left and actually let me go here so this is jesus you can see as i said some of the martyrs um, who are flanking him kind of interested of you know this is the final judgment of man and so they're interested to see who's going to be joining them in heaven uh, down here on the bottom left you see these well in the middle you see the angels on a cloud and uh, looks like they have uh, blow guns <laughs> but they're actually trumpets and so they're announcing the judgment and so a lot of um, people are being brought up, and, and also a lot of bodies that have been, I guess, buried, you know, uh, are being brought up to heaven as well. So they they are saved. And then on the bottom right, you have a very uh, classical rendition of hell, um, very reminiscent of Dante's Inferno, uh, the suffering. Okay, so this is the uh, River Styx going into Hades, and you can see uh, them being thrown, and this guy's being wrapped in a snake. So it's it's pretty graphic and scary, scary scene. Okay, I just thought this was a uh, interesting. This is a saint who, uh, saint, I, I don't know which one, but his his skin was kind of filleted off of him. So you can see that uh, painting. Some people say that that's a like a self portrait of my Michelangelo, the face of that uh, skin. Interesting. And then yeah, this is the fight. You know where I guess people are being cast cast down into hell so uh <clears throat> i don't know if they're coming from purgatory or what but it's it's really heaven or hell at this point there is no purgatory so they're being thrown out of purgatory i guess in into the pits of hell so at any rate okay so another piece that he was commissioned to do was to and this is when he was 71 years old so this is near the hit the uh end of his life so uh I guess late 1550s or 1560, not much had been done to St. Peter's Basilica. It had um, been rebuilt. St. Peter was the uh, believed to have been the first. I mean, he's one of the apostles and believed to be one of the the first popes. And so there was a church that was constructed uh, like in 300 after the Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity, and he there was a church. Uh, called St. Peter's uh, built and there was money raised uh, in a project to rebuild it uh, because it had fallen into disrepair and so they leveled it and they began the process of rebuilding it. The The uh, original architect, a guy by the name of Bramante, died and, uh, and I guess he had selected Raphael as his successor but Raphael died too and so um, Michelangelo was chosen to complete the project. Let's see. Not much was done. He changed a little bit uh, of the drawings or the designs, and then uh, his main focus was the dome, which you'll see here. So he did some work on the church itself, the basilica itself, but his, as I said, his main focus was the dome. This is the largest dome in the world. It stands 450 feet tall. It's one of the tallest churches in the wall in the world. So this kind of dwarfs. Um, Il Duomo uh, in Florence, <clears throat> 770 feet long, 500 feet wide. So this is this is quite large, okay. And this is right in the Vatican, in a, in the heart of Rome. Um, so you can see that's more of a, I guess, a eye level. So you can see the classical, the 
great columns uh, in the uh, in in the front of the church. This is you know kind of like the the Pope's papal residence. This is the inside. This is what the I guess the windows in the dome. I guess this feature quite uh, moving. I guess it was to suggest the presence of Christ in the church. Um, this is called the colonnade. This is actually a later architectural. This these hands that seem to be coming out and enveloping the piazza is another architectural movement, and it was done by an architect by the, by the name of Bernini, and it's known as Baroque. We'll talk about that later, but I just want to let you know that that's one and the same. But again, that's St. Peter's Basilica designer Michelangelo. Completion date was uh, fifteen or no, sixteen twenty six, I believe. So, oops, wrong way. All right. So as I said, uh, with the close of the uh, High Renaissance, a new era is uh, developed, and it's known as Mannerism. We'll, we'll talk about it because there's a Northern Mannerism movement, I guess. So we'll talk about that later. But basically, the hallmark of Mannerism is that um, exaggerated uh, paintings that start to... Um, play a little bit with how things really appear and so uh, and the and the reason is to kind of show the mood or uh, the effect that the inspiration is having on the artist and so you're you're going to have this altered um painting and that's kind of you know very uh, i guess early 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 uh, rendition or of a rendition of abstract art excuse me I can't think here anyway uh, one of the guys that is featured here this is El Greco um, who did this was this painting was done in Spain <laughs> he lived in he's a Greek he but he lived in Italy for the first half of his life and then took up residence in Spain the last 40 years of his life, I guess, and so that his name was El Greco, all right? Didn't live in Greece, came from Greece, lived in Italy, then he lived in Spain. This painting is just called Toledo, as in Toledo, Ohio. No, T Toledo, Spain. At any rate, uh, there's a portrait, of, a self-portrait of him up there, not very handsome, but be that as it may. So again, uh, the reason why I show you this is because We'll reference this when we start getting into um, a little bit more abstract, uh, impressionistic art. All right, so this guy was way ahead of his time. All right, and uh, so the exaggerated bodies, heavily muscled bodies that you saw on the wall of uh, the Judgment of Man, that that would also be indicative of mannerism art. The other guy, Titian, who made put Venice on the map as far as artwork is concerned, he completed a number of portraits for heads of state and their families. He did a number of paintings for Charles V, which is on the left here, a number of them. And then his um, son, who is the king of Spain, Philip II, uh, is who's featured there on the right. So um, Titian, as I said, did a lot of uh, portraits of high-ranking officials. Let's talk about Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci precedes uh, Michelangelo and inspired Michelangelo and Raphael, um, but he was a what people like to refer to, uh, perhaps Castiglione would have referred to as a, re a Renaissance man, a universal man, a uh, uomo universale, which is Italian. Uh, because he he did so much. He was an architect. He was an inventor. He was um, a painter. Okay, he was brilliant, but he was not trained in any of these uh, forms. He was even a scientist. Some would argue. All right, but he he had no official training. His bot um, his his notebook is what was discovered in the mid twentieth century. Kind of shares, I guess, exposes a lot of his interests, these notebooks that were written uh, in code, sort of, but 
his obsession with the human body. Um, and, and he learns strictly by observations. So, um, you know, he was able to uh, exhume some bodies and uh, study the anatomy, which was taboo at the time, but not for Leonardo da Vinci because he's Leonardo da Vinci. Here is an invention um, of a weapon of some sort. A uh, looks to be some enormous crossbow that he has created. So that would be pretty awesome to shoot. Uh, and some flying machine. Is it a s spaceship? Uh, some type of crude helicopter. Um, one of his other paintings or drawings is uh, this Vitruvian man, which is super important because it illustrates that Leonardo da Vinci was also a Neoplatonist uh, because of the circle, the divinities associated with that. That goes all the way back to classical temples being round. Um, and also you can see the symmetry that man has, proportional. Um, so I think that that's uh, important to note. He, uh, as a scientist, did all of this work uh, kind of by himself. And so he, and he wasn't trained. He didn't go to a university. So... He, his work isn't really considered scientific. Um, one of the greatest scientists of all time, um, Sir Isaac Newton, once said, if I've been able to see farther than everyone else, like talking about his, his inventions, or no, I mean his, his scientific discoveries, um, if I've been able to see further than everyone else, it's, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. So that means that he was able to build on the work of his predecessors, and we will actually be talking about that. Um, his work in astronomy, uh, and of course, calculus and physics. Oh, yay. What would we do without those? All right, so Vitruvian Man, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, his masterpiece is the Mona Lisa. It's tiny. It's only like 30 by 20 inches, so it's a tiny little painting. It's in the Louvre. Um, so, yeah, the enigmatic smile, uh, I don't know. You, you get some insight into the, um, the mysterious smile. I'm wondering, you know, what is she thinking? Is she happy? What, what's making her smile? Um, I don't know. But in the background, what is interesting is the use of a new technique that he came up with called sfumato, S-F-U-M-A-T-O, sfumato. What is sfumato, you might ask? It has... It means like smokiness. And so if you look in the background, he's got like two things going on. A little mysterious look with this shading that he's using in the background. And your eye is kind of drawn to that. But also, the contrast with the light and dark colors gives the illusion that this portrait or this background is, um, it's like it's dimly lit, all right? You know, like as the country, you know, as the sun is going down, um, there are still pockets that are dimly lit uh, and and I are illuminated. I, I think that that's pretty masterful. Uh, he obviously knows a thing or two about linear perspective, and I do believe this one, this painting, is done with oil base. So gone are the tempura paintings. Uh, the... Sistine Chapel was done with tempura uh, paint, pretty sure, as was this, The Last Supper, one of his other masterpieces. This was done on a, um, a church wall, and he was experimenting with some new techniques, and uh, it, was, it was damaged. But this is uh, G Jesus uh, of Nazareth uh, at his Last Supper, and he has revealed... Uh, to his 12 disciples or 12 apostles that somebody has will betray me okay and so as they're breaking bread and this is a very instrumental you know for Christians this moment when he is saying do this in memory of me or this idea of the Eucharist but he there's a bunch of stuff going on here all right so there's there's symmetry because the walls are flanked with those tapestries, uh, an equal number. Um, there are there's symmetry in the background, the vanishing point. There are three windows. Mm, the way in which the people are gathered around the table. 
uh, that flank Jesus, they are in clusters of three, and there are four of them, two on the right, two on the left. So that's proportional and symmetrical. Um, and then the uh, perspe uh, linear perspective is there too. So you guys get him. Ho hopefully you're paying attention to all of this, kids. But um, he, he tried to reveal the personality traits of each of the apostles um, by the way that he portrayed them. And uh, Jesus is in the shape of a triangle. And if you look at, um, let's see, the one, two, three, four, fifth guy, the fifth head, that kind of that bald-headed guy on the, on the left of Jesus, so the fifth from the left, is Peter. And what is Peter clutching in his hand? Well, you can see that he has grabbed himself a knife. Because he is angry, he wants to kill whoever um, betrays Jesus. And this is um, a moment of foreshadowing because what's going to happen later when he has arrested Jesus, that uh, Peter cuts the ear off of one of the uh, servants or one of the soldiers. And then just to the left of Peter is Judas. And this is... Uh, the artist's way of depicting how distant he is from Jesus. Not in physical proximity, because he's just three guys to the left of Jesus, but his angle, his body is like leaning away from Jesus to, sh to kind of suggest that, that betrayal. All right? Everybody got that? Got that? Very good. Moving on. Raphael. Um... Truly a genius, died at a very young age. So, what, 37 years old, he died. Um, known for a lot of frescoes, worked for a uh, number of popes, uh, and he is also famous for doing, I guess, his greatest type. Uh, he did a number of Madonnas with child. That means Madonna means Mary with child, and he did a number of those uh, oil-based paints. And here is one um, with, this is a very common scene. This is Jesus. And um, he is being given his kind of destiny, if you will, by John the Baptist, who is his second cousin. All right. So John the Baptist is seen there in like his typical bear skin um, high, or hide skin wool, robe, whatever he's got on clothing. And uh, Mary looks very uh, beautiful and sublime. Notice the background. No sfumato there, kids. Okay. But. Very good perspective. Um, so this is, as I said, um, by the symbolic giving of this little cross, he is kind of alluding to what a baby, you know, what Jesus' uh, mission is going to be when he's an adult. Okay? And then here is another one. It's called the Betrothal of the Virgin. This is a very famous painting. It's kind of... Re, uh, or I guess making a modern uh, rendition of the marriage of Jesus or of Joseph to the Virgin Mary, and I guess there was the, one of the relics that people, one of the churches claimed to have was the uh, wedding ring of uh, Mary, but I don't, I don't think she wore a wedding ring. I don't think that that tradition was alive back then. But at any rate, uh, it's in the center. And if you look just above it, you see the vanishing point through the doorway of that temple. So I think that's pretty um, incredible. The eye is kind of drawn up. And you can see that vanishing point. You can also see in that temple lots of uh, classical um, influences. You see the archways. You see the columns. And what shape is that temple? What's on top of it? A dome. What's what shape? A circle. Okay, so this is a divinity. This is the, the the hand of God, and it should be noted, kids. You better remember this: that Raphael was one of the most religious of all the uh, Renaissance painters, and so you can see a lot of that um, spirituality in in his paintings. All right, so Betrothal of the Virgin. Um, let's see what else. What else is going on? Uh, I think that's good. Oh, over here is uh, this is the Pope who uh, Pope Julius II who um, commissioned him to do a lot of a lot of the works. 
okay, for uh, many of the, I guess, offices of the papacy. All right, here's another one. This is School of Athens, um, and this is a very famous painting, like taking all of these classical uh, Greek thinkers and astronomers and mathematicians and putting them in one room when that was impossible. But um, you can also, again, see the perspective. You can see the, the Greek and Roman architecture. Um, there are a few people we'll, we'll make note of. Uh, in the center, you see um, two great philosophers. You, over here is uh, Plato, and here is Aristotle. Plato is made to look like, um, that looks like uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Yep, so it's kind of him giving like praise uh, to Leonardo da Vinci by making him in the Plato. But he's pointing up, which is very important because that's to suggest that man's ability to understand um, the universe is kind of outside of his senses. Uh, and then Aristotle is pointing down to kind of show that he is uh, somebody who's very interested in empirical evidence. You know, stuff that you can see, stuff that you can observe and prove. So that is uh, very indicative of both of their philosophies. And then to the uh, to the right here, you see the artist himself is a Raphael, young, handsome lad who has cleverly painted himself. And he's uh, kind of looking out at you, saying, what's up? So that is a creative way to kind of put yourself a sign, if you will, a, a portrait. And over here, excuse me, I wanted to focus on this. This is Michelangelo right here. He doesn't look too happy. Uh, Michelangelo is supposed to be a um, Greek writer by the name of Heraclitus, who you don't need to remember that. But this is this is what Michelangelo looked like, and he's brooding. He's he's upset because Pope Julius, the old guy over here, is hassling him all the time. Like, when are you going to finish? When are you going to get done with this uh, ceiling? All right. So that was, you know. And, and then also Michelangelo was a very nice guy. He was very difficult to work for, um, say, a lot of his uh, patrons. All right? But not him. He was very social, Raphael was. Very friendly. Everybody loved Raphael. All right. Hey, guess what? That's it. All right. I'm getting out of here. See you, kids. Bye.